I call the honourable member for Perth, I remind the House that this is the honourable member's first speech, and I ask the House to extend to him the usual courtesies. I call the honourable member for Perth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and congratulations to your to your re-election to your very important office. Uh, I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet and pay our respects to their elders, both past and present. I also acknowledge the traditional owners, the Noongar people of my local community, and also pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. And I stand before all of you today incredibly honoured and privileged at the trust that has been placed in me by my local community my friends and my family, as I address this chamber in my capacity as the federal member for Perth for the very first time. That only 10 others since Federation have been able to make such a claim brings the magnitude of this privilege into even sharper focus. But we are, by our very nature of having arrived here today, a competitive bunch, and we all quite rightly claim more boldly than each other, that the respective qualities of our electorates surpass easily all the rest. And not for the first time you will hear me make a confident, yet possibly unqualified claim mm -hmm. to it being beyond contention that the federal seat of Perth actually beats them all. I could extol the virtues of my local community until you have all gone home and the lights have gone out bordered by Perth City itself, Kings Park, flanked by the Swan River, the result is unrivalled beauty and diversity of ethnicities, cultures and values. A truly wonderful, culturally rich place with opportunities but also challenges around every corner. To the men and women in the federal seat of Perth, I am only here today because of the faith you have all placed in me, and I will not let you down. I am also incredibly honoured to have been allocated additional portfolio responsibilities in the Shadow Executive upon entering this place. As Shadow Assistant Minister for Western Australia, Resources, Innovation, the Digital Economy and Startups. Western Australia is, of course, important for a whole lot more than just mining and resources. But having said that, the economic impact the mining industry has upon our community is significant and can't be overstated. In 2013-2014, for example, the mining sector contributed $78 billion, or almost a third of West Australia's output alone. Once the impact of the resources sector is taken into account in relation to indirect employment opportunities and community engagement, it is abundantly clear that a key driver to our future prosperity in Western Australia involves careful planning and management of the resources industry so that all West Australians and indeed all Australians continue to derive a benefit from such an important and incredibly valuable part of our community. No discussion of the interface between the resources sector in Western Australia and government would be complete without recognising the work of Gary Gray, the former member for Brand. Indeed, I owe Gary a great deal, both for his support and friendship, but also for the fact that he also has the enduring confidence of the sector, which helps us greatly in ensuring a smooth transition from the past to the present. I am also incredibly excited about having the opportunity to contribute to our national conversation in relation to innovation, the digital economy and start-ups. Our communities and our places of work are changing forever, primarily due to rapid advances in technology, innovative disruption and automation. And, and it seems to me that our great challenge as a nation is to search out new ways of work and, and more importantly, to make sure that our workers of today and tomorrow are ready to take their place in a global economy. In my areas of portfolio responsibility, I have the great fortune of not only working with our leader, Bill Short, and the honourable member for Maribyrnong, but other immensely talented, hard-working shadow ministers in the member for Blacksland, Jason Clare, and Senator Kim Carr. To you all, I thank you 
in advance for what will be significant patients required. And, and a word of warning to all three of you, if the phrase, what Tim lacks in natural talent, he certainly makes up for in enthusiasm, springs to your mind. As I undertake those responsibilities, uh, I can assure you you are not singing solo. Um, <laughs> it's a common refrain shared by every teacher, friend or mentor I've had since about the age of five. Um, and on reflection, it was probably events of about that time indirectly that have caused me to arrive in this place. Mercifully for each and every one of you, restrictions on time limits on first speeches means I shall limit my story to the abridged version since that age. But growing up, if I possessed a, a character trait um, that rivalled my rampant enthusiasm, it was insatiable curiosity. My wife suggests that that's just being plain nosy, but I, I beg to differ. But with a, spring, a strict no um, television in the mornings policy in our house growing up, all roads actually led to the daily newspaper, the West Australian, for those seeking particulars. And I'd religiously read the West Australian in the morning, half the thrill to see if I could put it back together in its pre-ruffled state before the old man got to reading it, because if I didn't, the result was not pretty. But I can assure members that any connection between a plug for the West and the allegation they went very easy on me in the course of the federal campaign is purely coincidence and more to the fact that I live an entirely boring and unblemished life. And any alleged impeachable conduct almost certainly occurred in my youth, well before the digital age, and therefore never occurred at all. <laughs> Some 15 years later, my habit of reading the daily papers continued, and on one particular day, it was actually the 12th of June in 1996, I was a 20-something long-haired university student, couldn't grow a beard to save my life, um, and meandering through an arts degree. I stumbled, quite literally by chance, across a story in the paper uh, that was so powerful, it actually changed the direction of my life. The story was about Rex Dargi, a tribesman from a village in remote Papua New Guinea who, on behalf of tens and thousands of his fellow villagers, took BHP on in the Australian courts in a class action alleging wrongdoing for the damage done to the once crystal clear fly and Octeti rivers that now flowed, hopelessly polluted, past his home. And Rex Dargi was successful. It might actually be the closest I'll ever come to experience a moment of complete clarity, because right then it became pretty clear that with enough tenacity, with enough hard work, with more than a bit of luck and sheer force of will, victory for a just cause was achievable, even against an opponent who on face value just seemed too big, too well resourced, too clever. And I went in search of the Perth lawyer who acted for Rex Dargi and his thousands of fellow villagers, John Gordon. John would be much too modest ever to admit it. For those wannabe lawyers like me, uh, in search of a legal light on the hill, John Gordon was a modern incarnation of Chifley. And John gave me a chance, and I grabbed it and latched onto it like a limpet. And what a ride it was! Too young to be fearful, crashing out or crashing through court cases that coincidentally took me to Papua New Guinea as the Octeti litigation continued, and then on to Bougainville in another class action, being confronted by unrebels and being bitten by a mangy dog, uh, all in the quest for justice. And I also experienced working alongside litigation giants like Peter Gordon during the time he and others took on the fight against Big Tobacco on behalf of a dying Roller McCabe as she was stricken with lung cancer and breathing her last breaths. But being in the thick of those fights against such powerful, well-resourced and well-organised opponents taught me that we couldn't always rely upon large corporates to get it right. Sometimes it was essential for someone to be there to hold them to account, to ask tough and uncomfortable questions and seek justice on behalf of those whose voices were otherwise just not heard. And it was a desire to help remedy that injustice that took me closer to home, back to Perth, to work as a lawyer and then a barrister representing men and women in the courts who were dying from mesothelioma and lung cancer, their lives robbed in the cruelest 
manner possible by an insidious and vile industrial disease caused by exposure to asbestos. And almost without exception, decades of their life, their love, their laughter, their memories were stolen from these women and men as a result of exposure to a deadly dust in circumstances that were entirely preventable. Preventable because available knowledge surrounding the harm caused by exposure to asbestos had existed as far back as the 1890s. But the reality was asbestos companies, employers and governments had simply not done enough to stop people from getting sick. Good government could have fixed it, but it wasn't fixed, and people died because it wasn't fixed. So my working life became bedside courtrooms, shaking hands with my dying client as we landed a settlement just hours before trial. And what I will never, ever, ever forget about those handshakes is that they went on for just a little bit too long and their grasp was just a, a little bit too tight. It was too tight and it was too long because you could just tell they wanted to hold on to a life as theirs was slipping away. And outside the courtroom, while all that was going on, it took a Labor government in New South Wales to step up and set up a special commission of inquiry to investigate whether James Hardy had left enough money behind to compensate current and future victims of asbestos disease. It's now common knowledge, of course, that they had not. And then we saw Greg Combe and the trade union movement, together with the victims' groups led by Robert Vajakovic and Bernie Banton, hammer out a deal that made James Hardy stay and pay. But where all of that actually began was good government done well in setting up that special commission of inquiry. And, and that's what brought me to the Labor Party. It was a Labor government making decisions to keep James Hardy accountable whilst having the welfare of ordinary working women and men in front of mind. So much of my legal work has been privileged over the years to undertake for precisely the same reason that I want to be here in doing whatever it takes to get outcomes that are fair, reasonable and just. More recently, that's taken me to the far reaches of the northwest of Western Australia, dragging a courtroom out to remote Aboriginal communities in the Kimberley, getting compensation for Aboriginal victims of road trauma on instructions from a rough and tumble, crazy, brave bush lawyer by the name of Tom Cannon, who's also known as the crash bash man to his Aboriginal clients, for many of whom English is actually their second language. So, it's always been, for me, a belief that distributive justice, or at the very least compensation to address a wrongdoing, can go a very long way to restoring a balance when injustice has occurred. But it's actually here, in this place, on behalf of our electorates and with the beliefs that we all hold so dear, that I think we've actually got a chance to get ahead of that curve, to improve lives to improve outcomes in our communities and, most importantly, to enact or repeal laws that stop injustice or inequity from occurring. And I really want to be a part of that. I want to be able to contribute on behalf of those in our community who, for one reason or another, just cannot advocate for themselves. I believe when federal government is done well, it is the most effective and efficient means to improve the lives of every Australian. And my best guess is we achieve that positive change in politics by being bold, by being a big target, sometimes by doing a lot of little things or even boring things which actually result us living a big life in this place, and putting our collective reputations on the line by actually spelling out how we want to improve outcomes in education, health, create more jobs that sees us punch above our weight globally. Being brave and bold saw us avoid a recession in the wake of the global financial crisis, and I couldn't be more proud together with having the utmost respect for the member for Lilly and my great friend Jim Chalmers, a member for Rankin, to say that I'm actually now part of a federal parliamentary team in 2008-2009 created hundreds and thousands of jobs that meant this country avoided recession, while the rest of the developed world reeled from a GFC. Being brave and bold saw us challenge the paradigm of care and support for the catastrophically injured and unwell when Labor created the National Disability Insurance Scheme under the guiding hand of our current leader, Bill Shorten, who I first met on the campaign trail in 2010, trying to dislodge the member for Swan, who I see is still stubbornly here. <laughs> what struck me at the time was how committed and how focused Bill was in encouraging the disability sector to organise in a way that meant working together 
with Labor would achieve unstoppable change for the ultimate benefit of the disabled or the impaired and their carers, all of whom had been marginalised in our society for just too long. And I keep the faith that somehow, somewhere, we will eventually see the completion of what could be our most magnificent infrastructure project since the Hoi Snowy Mountains Hydro Scheme, which is a proper national broadband network that is truly future-proof with a capacity to actually unleash our enormous potential onto the world. Mm -hmm. I believe that good government done well will address once and for all the overwhelming and institutional pain of Aboriginal Australians and those abused in institutional care. And good government done well has a responsibility to steer our national conversation to a place that celebrates diversity and tolerance, not to a place where it is shouted down. Mr Speaker, representing men and women dying of asbestos disease in a courtroom has taught me that every single second is precious and life is just very short, and our obligation is to live a big life. But being, living a big life doesn't mean making a big noise or even arriving here. Living a, a big life means something unique to all of us. There's no playbook. There's no template. But our recent federal campaign was a big campaign with big ideas, and it was a campaign I was incredibly proud to be a part of. I thank our leader, Bill Short, and the honourable member for Maribyrnong, my great friend Chris Bowen, Tanya Plibersek, Anthony Albanese, um, Mark Dreyfus, Ed Husick, and a host of others for all of their unwavering support that you provided me over a gruelling 100-day campaign without any hesitation at all to allow us to keep the federal seat of Perth in Labor hands. But I thank more than anyone else my beautiful wife, Lindsay, and my little girls, Sydney and O'Hara, or more commonly known as Sid and Harry. Uh, you guys are everything to me. And Lindsay, I know that you know I am brimming with pride at the moment, but make no mistake, as moments go, <coughs> it comes forth. Behind the birth of our two girls and, of course, getting married to you. None of this will work for the right reasons unless we're in it together and by each other's sides. To my campaign team and my immediate predecessor, Alana McTiernan, also to Bruce, Tommy Kazali, Rob, John, Megan, Ron, Daniel, Mark, Prue, Colleen, Wade Lapp, Chris Prass, to my advisor, campaign auditor and all-time polling day sidekick, Stephen Smith. Thanks to all of you and thank you to the hundreds of others who helped me on the campaign. Thank you to all of the branch members in the federal seat of Perth and in Western Australia generally, and thank you to the mighty, mighty North Perth branch, of course, and all of the others whose sadly uh, names time does not permit me to mention. To the trade union movement to supporting, for supporting me and my campaign, in particular Gerard Dwyer and Peter O'Keefe at the SDA, to Scott McDyne, Stephen Price and Mike Zutbrut at the AWU and Tony Sheldon and Tim Dawson at the TWU, I thank you. To the Praetorian Guard, Glenda, Brendan Lawrence. None of us is having fun. <laughs> to my lifelong mates, some of whom have made the trip for various capital cities around Australia and are here in the gallery today, I thank you. To the Q Court, you will always be my ethical and philosophical compass. Thank you to my mum, my sisters Karen and Megan, to Jackie and Ivan, to the ones I love who are not here anymore. I constantly look to you for inspiration. David Prast, Sharon Fletcher and, of course, my dad, now gone more than 10 years. So, as you can see, Mr Speaker, many people have helped me live a big life in this world, but our new world doesn't sit cosily alongside our old world. Our teenagers are more likely to use their spare time collaborating, collaborating with 20 other programmers, artists and writers all over the world in real time to create web-based computer games in their bedroom in their spare moments. Globalisation seems to be now, and our challenge seems to be to embrace this change, not chase after it in a clumsy attempt to catch up. That, that means a new conversation about what it means for mums and dads and kids, and most of all, it means a new conversation about what it means for prosperity, for productivity, for creating new jobs. I remain completely convinced now more than ever that a Labor government is best placed to create that opportunity for our old and new generations to strive to achieve a new Australian community that takes the best of who we are and applies it to our new world. To give every single Australian the opportunity to ex exercise their fundamental right to achieve their full potential. 
to skill up workers transitioning out of traditional employment roles so they grab with both hands the opportunities in our digital economy, everything it has to offer, to invest in our kids, to close the gap, to care for the most vulnerable and marginalised in our society, to make marriage equality a reality right now. That, Mr Speaker, is good government done well. And when I'm done and when we turn out the lights and the next member for Perth takes my place, what do I hope my contribution to public life might look like? I just want the people of Perth, my colleagues and my party to know that I have given it everything. I just want to play a very small part in my own way in creating a prosperous Australia that is competitive on the world stage. I want my family to be proud of what I've worked towards and I hope above all else my girls think I've done okay. Because, Mr Speaker, if I can achieve all of that, I don't reckon life gets any bigger.